Hello. In this screencast, we'll look at computation and memory management in Dask. In the next few minutes, we'll talk about laziness, the persist and compute methods, as well as futures as they pertain to pointers to remote data. In this example, we're going to play with some Dask data frames, although this works for any Dask collection like arrays, bags, or delayed as well. Here I've constructed a Dask data frame of 30 partitions uh, with a few columns. Let's peek at a little bit of that data set just to get a sense for what it does. Now Dask data frames by default are lazy. That means that when I perform operations, like here I'm constructing a new Z column by adding the X and Y columns, I haven't actually done any work. I've increased the number of tasks of my data frame column. There's now a new Z column. Now, rather than constructing in 30 tasks, I now have 150 different Python functions to run. Those Python functions I can visualize with the visualize method. This shows us a pictorial diagram of the recipe that we need in order to construct our final result. At the bottom, at the bottom there's many small functions that create some random data. At the top, there's the results of adding up the Z column with some intermediate computations in the middle. Now again, by default, Dask hasn't done any work yet. We've just constructed the plan. If we want to then submit that plan to Dask, we can call the persist method. Persist takes that graph and it ships it over to the scheduler. We see that graph over here in the lower right. This is the graph as the scheduler sees it, as it's trying to compute things. What we got back was another Dask data frame. This one, again, there's only 30 tasks to do. We've done, we've sent everything else to the scheduler. And so our graph for this resulting data frame is now much, much more flat. It has just 30 little boxes, each of which are pointing to remote results on the Dask cluster. Those little boxes are futures. Let's talk about futures for a moment. So we can use the futures of function to ask for all the futures held on to by any particular Dask collection. And here you see that this Dask collection is holding on to 30 futures. So a future is pointing to some piece of data living in some Dask worker elsewhere. In this case, we can see that all of them are finished and that there's many different pandas data frames. We also see this key, that's the address in Dask space for that particular pandas data frame. Let's go and look at our Dask workers a little bit more in depth and let's go find out where these pandas data frames live. So here I'm looking at the Dask dashboard. There's a whole different screencast on the Dask dashboard if you want. We're just going to drill into these info pages. We're taken to a screen that has our set of four workers. And we see that our four workers have a bunch of objects in memory. You know, 10 Python objects, 6 Python objects, 7 Python objects, etc. Let's go to this one. So it has these six objects that have these names assign, E, F, D, etc., number 13. If we go back to our notebook, we notice that those are the same keys that we have here backing our pandas data or backing our Dask data frame. Let's go look at one of them, maybe this one with the number one on it. We see that it is in memory. It is a pandas data frame that weighs in at about eight to nine megabytes large. So we can get a lot more information about these individual pandas data frames. And this pandas data frame is living in memory on this particular Dask worker. So this worker has a bunch of these pandas data frames. It has about a third or a quarter of all of the data frames in total. So our Dask data frame is just pointing to all of these pandas data frames that are living in memory on all of our various workers. So Dask will hold on to these futures, will hold on to these pandas data frames for as long as a future exists. If I were to delete this object DF and all references to the futures, Dask would then feel free to remove that memory to delete those pandas data frames. And actually has done so already with some of our other intermediate variables. If we look at our previous graph that we sent to Dask here, we see that there are actually many other intermediate values. There are small here, but notice there are many small circles and boxes here. Those, are, those all used to be Python objects, but now they've been released. And we can see that in our version of the Dask graph here on the scheduler, our uh, assigned tasks are all in memory because they have futures pointing to them. But previous tasks like make time series, those have been created and then released. There's no active future pointing to those results. 
so Dask feels free to remove those data from memory. It still knows about them, because we have results that depend on them, but they're, they're cleaned up. So Dask will only hold in RAM variables for which there is an active future pointing to that variable. In this way, your memory management in your Python process mirrors the memory management in Dask. If you delete this future and all references to it, Dask will feel free to delete it as well and the data that backs it, the pandas data frame. Now you may also be familiar with the compute method. I might call df.compute. This is actually a bit tricky. You don't want to do this because compute takes a Dask object and returns a non-Dask result. In this case, a pandas data frame. But if we did that, we'd have to move all of these pandas data frames to one machine to bring down that full result. Often this is a bad idea to do with large data sets because you might not have enough memory in your one you know, Jupyter Notebook session to handle all the large results. It's much more commonly used with smaller results. So for example, remember that our graph is again quite small. We might do uh, some computation, for example. Here we're building up a new graph. That is just a single output, which is probably be a single number. So in that case, it might make sense to call compute. This will go ahead, it'll do the computation. We see that we've sent the graph off to the scheduler. It's doing its work. And the thing we'll get back is not a Dask object, it is a normal Python object. In this case, a pandas series. So again, persist returns Dask objects, like Dask data frame and Dask arrays, where the graph has been sent to the scheduler for computation. Compute does the same thing, but it takes that result and turns it into a non-Dask object, like a NumPy array or pandas data frame, and gives you that locally. We tend to use compute with small results and persist with large intermediate results. So great, in this screencast, we saw the Dask collections were lazy. We saw that with persist, we can send graphs from the Jupyter Notebook session off to the scheduler. We then talked a little bit about futures and how they determine what Dask feels that it has to hold on to and what it can release. We then finally saw a little bit about the differences between persist and compute. Hopefully these help you make better sense of Dask memory management and help you make better decisions in the future.